Good to see each of you here. We're in the book of Acts. We have come to the city of Antioch in Pisidia. Uh, the uh, missionaries have been sent from the other city of Antioch in uh, Syria, Syrian Antioch. And what we found is that um, the, uh, when you are a visiting rabbi to a synagogue, they invite you to stand and speak. So um, uh, the Apostle Paul stands to uh, speak and uh, uh, he, we're looking at his sermon let me back up a bit here to uh, see if I can review that. Um, okay, the sermon. Um, he begins with Israel's holy mission. He speaks of the special people, God's purposes, uh, that God chose the fathers to exalt them when they were strangers in the land of Egypt. Then he spoke of God's protection with a high arm, brought them out of the bondage of Egypt. <clears throat> then he speaks of God's patience. About the time of 40 years, suffered he their manners, referring to their manner of life, <clears throat> um, in the wilderness. So picturing them as a rebellious people. And then a special place, a land bestowed in love. He gave them the promised land of Canaan. He gave them, uh, however, they were, the land became blighted by their lust, so they had judges for the space of 450 years, he says. This is where they rebelled. God let the uh, foreigners, uh, or I guess they're natives there, but yet the people conquering them, abusing them, oppressing them, and then he'd raise up a judge to liberate them. Then he begins to speak of... Uh, uh, the uh, blessed at last when Samuel the prophet came and the uh, whole school of the prophets began people began to hear the word of God re be receptive to the word of God as we're praying for our missionaries of the week is the Heritage Baptist College um, it's one of those things that the offer of teaching the word of God is there but uh, is there somebody wanting to come and listen you know that's that's the case. When the culture turns against God, uh, there's not as many fringe people that are interested in uh, learning. But uh, he goes on to speak then of the special promise that was a promised Messiah, and uh, he promised he raised up unto Israel a Savior, Jesus, and uh, then he gave the promised messenger, um, John the Baptist, we find then that uh, uh, Israel made a hideous mistake, for Christ did come, but um, uh, he challenged his hearers to repent, to uh, turn, but uh, the charge against them is that they knew not him they who should have been the closest to him, and then the prophecies, they condemned him. Uh, they fulfilled the prophecies of the prophets before them by condemning him. Their willful insistence, they desired Pilate that he should be slain, and their wicked intransigence, they wouldn't change their mind. When they had fulfilled what was written of him, they took him down to the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. Well, we come now to the part of the sermon in uh, chapter 13, where Jesus triumphed the resurrection of Christ. <clears throat> he was rejected, despised of men. And, uh, but uh, in 1330 to 37, he speaks of the resurrection. This was the great message of uh, the New Testament. We see the proof, the resurrection, but God raised him from the dead and the appearances and he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto this people. Uh, he summarizes the disciples who became the apostles. 
The disciples are the learners. The apostles are the ones who were sent. And um, so he says this is what happened. Then the proclamation, he turns back to the scripture and goes to the second psalm. Uh, he doesn't introduce it like that, but um, he just goes back to the scripture. It's prophecy fulfilled. We declare unto you glad tidings how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, in that he raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm. He does call it the second psalm. I forgot that. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Once they get in the middle, they don't keep numbering them, but the second was easy to remember. I found uh, Arthur Pink uh, writing on the book of Hebrews, and in that he refers back to this passage in Acts 13. Um, he says, there the apostle, in, in Acts 13, there the apostle declares to the Jews that God had fulfilled the promise made unto the fathers, namely that he had <coughs> raised up Jesus. In other words, he had sent Messiah unto them. He says here, he, he uh, declares that Acts 13.33 has no reference to Christ's resurrection, but relates to his incarnation and manifestation to Israel. So I thought that was an interesting uh, change on this. He's already talked about the resurrection. The fact that he brings it up again is just a little bit of a, uh, you know, why would he do that? And uh, Pink's idea is that he's simply talking about raising him up uh, to, to be the influence. Um, Deuteronomy 18, 18, I will raise them up a prophet. See, raising up a prophet is not a resurrection of a prophet, but uh, raising up of a prophet, uh, also in Acts 3.26. It is not until Acts 13, 34, 35 that the apostle brought in the resurrection, raised him up from the dead. Thus, in Acts 13, 13, Psalm 2 is cited to prove that the Father had sent the Savior to Israel and his promise to do so had been fulfilled in the divine incarnation. And I, uh, I tend to agree with this. I think this is a, a, a narrow um, uh, just, you know, a, a narrow interpretation, but one that, that fits the passage. So um, I went back to this passage in Acts raised up Jesus again, translates the uh, Greek words which are literally raised Jesus. If raised again was in there, if again was in there, then this would count against Pink's meaning, but it isn't in there. Um, uh, so uh, they were assuming that it was talking about the resurrection when they translated it, but um, it was added by the translators. It does not contradict Pink's in interpretation. So I think because he's actually talking about raising up a prophet, uh, he probably hasn't got into the resurrection yet. Then it's prophecy focused, and as concerning that, he raised him up from the dead. Now he gets into that part of the resurrection. Raised as a prophet uh, uh, before the people and now raised up from the dead. Now no more to return to corruption. Corruption is rottenness, you know, it's what, what people do in the grave. Uh, the, uh, they said they found uh, the grave of one of the great composers and they dug it up, opened it up, and there he was sitting there erasing note by note what he had written. They said, what are you doing? He said, decomposing. <laughs> so, uh, I can't help it, I always remember the puns. Now no more to return to corruption. He said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Uh, mercies is the, the Greek word standardly translated holy. Um, the, why did our uh, translators translate it mercies here? The words are quoting Isaiah 55, 3, which in our Bible says, incline your ear, come unto me, uh, here and your soul shall live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. So the translators just followed the practice of the Septuagint in translating uh, the word for holy as mercies um, to agree with Isaiah 55.3. We in our thinking then need to um, 
God's holiness was actually demonstrating part of his mercy. He moves on to the 16th Psalm, <clears throat> and um, so he speaks of a truth. Wherefore he saith also in another Psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Uh, Psalm 16:10. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Uh, so a truth, a tomb, for David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep, meaning he died, and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. He says, he's basically saying, David wrote this, but not about himself, because it's quite evident that he actually did die, was put in a tomb, left in that tomb, and uh, saw corruption there. And then a transformation, but he whom God raised again saw no corruption. Uh, the, the promised Messiah raised from the dead. He goes on to then speak of his, uh, Israel's historic moment, and uh, that he says, now before you is Israel's historic moment. The gospel welcome, the pardon offered. Be it known unto you therefore, having said all of this by way of introduction, he now basically gives an invitation. Be it known unto you therefore, brethren, uh, men and brethren, that though this man is preached, that, uh, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. Through Jesus Christ, we can preach forgiveness of sins. The point here is that only the work of Christ allows forgiveness of sin, you see. There is, there is no forgiveness promised in any other covenant, only the new covenant, uh, Christ's death, um, will deal with forgiveness of sin. So the pardon is offered, now the portion offered, and by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. He says, don't perpetuate the false thinking that you can do this on your own. It was the law from God. And if understood correctly, it would drive you to Jesus. Galatians tells us that. But it would drive you to Jesus basically by despair. Because you would say, no matter how hard I try, I can't keep the law. I was sadly amused by uh, reading uh, the biography of, uh, a recent biography of Benjamin Franklin, who rejected uh, uh, salvation and that type of thing, but decided that he was uh, smart enough to come up with his own mor moral law. So he came up with a, a whole series of laws and wrote it out. And, then he decided he would just work for, you know, an extended period of time on overcoming this one fault. When he was done with that, he would go to the next one. Finally, he'd be perfect. So he had it all figured out. And then uh, as he did this, he found out that it was too deep, it was too embedded, and uh, no matter how hard he tried, uh, he, had, he had to start cycling back and going back over. He had, he had fallen down on some of the things that he uh, uh, had thought he had conquered before. Uh, when, he, when, you, when you make a, a clear statement of righteousness, we fail even in, in, in our own law. But the Bible speaks of God's justice, dealing with his salvation, not his condemnation. All men automatically deserve condemnation. God is not waiting to see how you live, whether to let you into heaven or hell. He's not waiting to see if he should condemn you. You started out that way. That's how you were born. You were born in that condition. God needs to justify himself when he does not condemn man. He does not need to justify himself when he, when he condemns. The gospel warning. He tells them, be, beware and behold. Beware, beware therefore, lest that come upon you which is spoken of in the prophets. There is a, a curse, there is a prophecy of damnation given in the prophets. And behold, behold ye despisers and wonder and perish.
For I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. He goes back to the prophet Habakkuk. Habakkuk 1.5, Behold ye among the heathen, and regard, wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days which will, you will not believe, though it be told you. Now Paul's quote comes from the Septuagint, <clears throat> the Greek translation rather than the Hebrew. The word perish comes from the Septuagint. Uh, Strong's uh, anaphanizo, meaning strictly to cause to vanish away. Um, perish, just to, uh, to go away. So that was his invitation. Uh, be very careful. Now everything has been accomplished for your salvation. And what is demanded of you now is belief. We see the results. He's speaking to the men and brethren there, he mentions them. The men are the Gentiles who have come and are following the Jewish way. And then the brethren would be the, the Jews themselves. So we see the results here. First of all, the Gentiles' response, it was interest. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. The Greek here, in the week between or in the Sabbath between. Now, when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. The grace of God rather than self-works, following the law, the moral law. Uh, besought the uh, congregation, uh, the uh, people following him, besought them... Um, it is the word parakaleo, possible, meaning they exhorted them, they encouraged them, they comforted them. Uh, you, you'd be welcome, they say. And next Sabbath, literally into the next Sabbath, could mean during the week. Uh, they weren't necessarily waiting for another week before they would come back to the service. A.T. Robertson says the King James translation is correct. Uh, the next Sabbath would be the normal way of taking the Greek terms. Congregation is... Synagogue, it's the word for synagogue. And religious proselytes means devout Gentile worshipers. The involvement, and the next Sabbath, Luke tells us, Sabbath day, came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. Now, I thought it was interesting that up to this time, Jews and proselytes are excited about this news. But... It's the Gentiles who, who gathered in this that the work was done and it's not a matter of finding every little nuance of the Mosaic law and following it to get salvation. They, they caught that. And so they are talking to the other people. You should have heard what we heard at the synagogue. What, more things we can't do? And he says, no, no, we found out about salvation, that a man died for us. So uh, nearly the whole city came together next Sabbath. This caused the Jews' reaction. You know, if you put something on your skin and you have a reaction, <laughs> it uh, irritates the skin. They envied. Hey, the whole town never came when we were preaching. Troubled by the Jews. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Why? Because they saw that it was biblically wrong? <laughs> no. They were just envious. They invented reasons to contradict it because they didn't like this. Jewish persecution was based upon envy. Contradicting means speaking against. A.T. Robertson says it was... The interruption of the service, an open opposition in public meeting. Paul and Barnabas were guests by courtesy and, of course, could not proceed further when denied that privilege. So trouble by the Jews. Then we see turning by the missionaries. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, they said, pointing to the Jews. 
But seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee a light to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. Unto the ends of the earth is to the uttermost part of the earth, uh, what Christ had said earlier. And uh, it's also a quote from Isaiah 49, 6. He said, it is, a light thing, uh, is, it is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee a light for the Gentiles that thou mightest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. And that would be more than just the Jews. The Isaiah text is set firmly in the context of the prophecy of the Messianic kingdom. And this turning to the Gentiles was not a forsaking of the Jews, as covenant theology teaches, that they turned from the Jews. Uh, they just emphasized the preaching. Um, in 14.1, a little later, we see that the synagogue teaching was continued. Uh, it's just that uh, they said we're openly turning to the Gentiles, opening this up. And then the triumph for the Gentiles. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad. In other words, they were not just, the missionaries were not leaving. They were staying, turning to the Gentiles. And glorified the word of, of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. Um, ordained to eternal life. Uh, ordained is the word meaning placed in a certain order. They were arranged, they were assigned a place or appointed. Uh, this isn't God just saying, well, only those that I've chosen can get saved. It is uh, um, those who were in that place then uh, believed. And the word of the Lord was published. Uh, published means carried. It was carried about. Well, turning to the Gentiles was not something that they figured that uh, Jews should do. So they were enraged, and we see more trouble of, by the Jews. But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts. Anybody been expelled? Just Donna? No? No. Just easy. Sorry. Well, the testimony by the missionaries, but they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came into Iconium. Now, I suppose that if you were talked bad about and sent away, the last thing you would have imagined to do is to just stop and shake the dust of your feet off. I don't want to carry my dust, your dust with me. You know, sounds like a very strange thing. But uh, we... Uh, we find out that this is a, a, a commanded thing. Shook off the dust of their feet against them was a sign of leaving them to their own obstinate ways. I'm not sure what the symbolism, how that, how that works out, but that's what it was. We find this Matthew 10, 14. Jesus told his disciples as he sent them out, Whosoever shall not receive you nor hear your words, when you depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Uh, we say today, just shake it off. You know, it's not a personal thing. It's not about you. It's about something. Shake it off. And I think there's almost that kind of that concept of it. Yes. We say we wash our, our hands of them. Yeah, wash your hands of them. Um, this is the idea that don't carry their baggage with you. Shake it off. See, Mark six ten, or excuse me, Mark six eleven. Uh, and whosoever shall not receive you nor hear you when you depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say to you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment for that city than for that city. So this is a mark against them and uh, <laughs> certainly a, a memorable thing. Shake off those sandals and clack them together like you did the erasers when you were helping the teacher back in the <clears throat> elementary school and um, leave that cloud for them. Then we see the triumph for the Christians, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. So the 
uh, the trial, the persecution, uh, getting chased out of the city. It actually um, was a blessing. They were filled with joy, filled with the Holy Ghost. A.T. Robertson says, it's the imperfect passive. They kept on being filled with joy. J.A. Alexander, in his commentary, we have here another instance of a fact already noticed, that the primitive disciples are repeatedly described as rejoicing in the very circumstances which might seem particularly adapted to produce an op opposite effect. That the cause of this effect was supernatural, we learn from the concluding words. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. So uh, when you're filled with the Holy Ghost, then you begin to interpret the things around you in a, in a better way. You begin to see it from, through God's eyes. And uh, what would they be seeing? Well, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, when you are persecuted, count all joy. Well, this is the way they treated the prophets. So I never thought of myself like an Isaiah or somebody, you know, but here we are getting persecuted. But it says that they went on to Iconium. So here is Iconium. Let me talk to you a little bit about that. Iconium was 80 miles from Pisidian Antioch. That was a fur piece. At the precise time Paul visited this town, it was not a part of Lyconia, though it was both before and after his visit. Much later, the Seljan Turks set up an empire with Iconium as the capital. They were Muslims from Central Asia, east of the Caspian Sea, and in the mid-1000s, they conquered Armenia, Palestine, and most of Iran. It is the modern Konya at the foot of Mount Taurus, about 120 miles inland from the Mediterranean Sea, having a population of about 40,000. So if you travel over there, ask for Konya, and you come to Iconium. He gets there. Convincing speech. It came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews, and so spake that a great multitude, both, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, believed. So they didn't stop preaching to the Jews. They went back to the uh, synagogue in this new city. And... Uh, a great multitude of the Jews and also of the Greeks believed. The contentious sinners and the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Uh, so you, you find the ones who aren't getting saved and you stir them up and talk about these religious fanatics and uh, the problems that they're causing and so on. Um, then the conspicuous signs. Long time, therefore, abode they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace, and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. We haven't heard a lot about this, uh, the miraculous work being done. Um, so uh, I find it interesting here that in the midst of, the, uh, uh, of a false account, against them, stirring up the unbelievers, God begins to show his power by giving them miraculous powers. Uh, not giving them powers, but allowing miracles to be done uh, at their words and uh, by the laying on of their hands. Uh, it says here that they were a long time they abode there, even in the midst of this persecution. A long time is literally a sufficient period of time, and time is chronos, meaning chronological time. Then continuing struggles. We find the divided attitudes, but the multitude of the city was divided and part held with the Jews against them and part with the apostles. Then the destructive assault. They're not left to their wits. They're not left to arguments. Um, and when there was an assault made, both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews with their rulers, to use them despitefully and to stone them they were aware of it. Somebody said what was happening. They told them. So to use them despitefully means to insult them with contemptuous speech or conduct. Uh, that could be a beating, that could be imprisonment, whatever. To stone them indicates the Jews were leading this assault because that was the uh, main uh, capital punishment of the Jews. And they were aware of it uses an aggressive participle to indicate they became aware of it. 
Uh, they just didn't happen, but they became aware of it. Words were spoken, and a friend of a friend said, you know what these people were talking about, and they're going to do this, and so they became aware of it. So uh, we find in the next uh, part of that verse that they fled unto Lystra and unto Derby. Well, Lystra is a town of Lyconia. Now we've moved back into uh, Lyconian property. They crossed the border beyond the legal jurisdiction of the Iconium authorities. A young Timothy probably saw the events that occurred on this visit. It was a Roman colony, like uh, Lystra is, uh, located on a hill about one mile northwest of Katin Sarai, which is situated 18 miles southwest of Iconium. So they moved about 18 miles, a uh, full day's journey, 20 miles, 20-mile uh, hike. So they get there, and so they continued the message. They fled unto Lystra and Derby, cities of Lyconia, and unto the region that lieth round about, and there they preached the gospel. So you preach where you can, as long as you can, and then when, when it's just too tough and it's pulling teeth, you move to someplace else. Uh, something happened there. We find a crippled man. The man is healed, and he is a hard case. There sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, without power in his feet, being a cripple, and notice this, from his mother's womb, who, had n who never had walked. I want you to imagine this man. I want you to imagine his legs. He's bound up. He's sitting someplace begging. And, um, or, or sitting someplace uh, being cared for by family or something. But I want you to look at those legs. These are legs, full grown, but they've never walked. Those thin little legs and knobby knee and, and uh, uh, no, those muscles never got exercised. Then a heart concern. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him and perceiving that he had faith to be healed. A historic cure. Said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and walked. I, I don't know whether those little string bean muscles just became strong, or did those legs look different now? Did they inflate like a little uh, pencil balloon thing, you know? Pop up? I don't know. But, uh, wow. Uh, this was uh, just so amazing. I, I see, I have in the past seen these uh, healers in their tent meetings, you know. And a uh, person stands up, a little crooked, and he says, yeah, problem with your back, straighten up, straighten up, and then they heal him of this, you know. and there's no real sign that anything really happened, except they got him uh, pumped up to <laughs> think they can do it. This, this was totally amazing. He leaped and walked. He had never walked. He, he had never learned to walk. This man never learned to walk. It was given to him at this moment. <laughs> you know, I, I was reading about people that had uh, uh, their big toes amputated, I forget what for, wearing too short shoes or something, I don't know, but they had, had their big toes amputated, they had to learn to walk over again because the balance was completely off. This man had never walked. God heals him and he healed, he healed the mind as well as the, the legs. All right, um, the multitude Hysterical. The real excitement. And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying, In the speech of Lyconia. And I find that interesting. What else would they speak? You know, perhaps the Greek. They could have spoken Greek, but this was in, in the, the native dialect. The gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. <laughs> now, this caused me to assume certain things, and I'll explain this as we go. So their real excitement, and then their ready explanation, 
And they called Barnabas, who was evidently the taller guy, Jupiter, and they called Paul Mercurius, Mercury, because he was the chief speaker. <laughs> and uh, so they said, it's the gods. In fact, we know who they are. I uh, find that Jupiter is an interesting word. Um, Jeb Porter, uh, having studied these things out, uh, explained this. Jupiter is the Latin equivalent of the Greek god Zeus. The Texas Receptus has dia, which uh, could be the, the Greek word for through, but um, the Strong's Concordance lists it as Zeus, but as you can see from the Greek letters, dia, uh, more accurately it's the word dios, and uh, not Zeus, the name, but dios, the gen generic title for God. Uh, found, the only time that word is found in the Greek is dioscuri. It's translated Castor and Pollux because they knew who, who the dioscuri were, but literally it means Zeus's son or sons of God. So Jupiter is a contraction of Jove and Pater, God the Father. Now, this to me is quite interesting because he was the head god, Jupiter, and um, uh, you know the, the most giant planet was named for him. But it speaks of the past where they understood who the, who the main god was, and they called him God the Father. The Latin pronunciation of Jove, and you, you see in some of the old uh, British movies where the guy says, "By Jove," you know. That's, that's the Jove we're talking about, would have been Yahweh. <laughs> How about that? Sounds pretty much like Yahweh, the Hebrew name for God. So Yahweh Pater. And this is, um, this is where they got the name Jupiter. And then Mercurius is the Latin equivalent of the, god, the Greek god Hermes. Hermes was the messenger of the gods. I don't know if you've seen pictures of Mercury, but he had uh, wing, uh, wings on his uh, sandals, on his feet, on his shoes. And um, uh, so he was fleet. He could fly uh, where he wanted to go to, to transmit the message. He was eloquent in speech. He was the inventor of language, according to them, and the god of magic. Mercurius is Strong's 2060 Hermes. And uh, so uh, it, they didn't use the, uh, they were using the Greek terms. Now, the Encyclopedia Britannica says of Ovid, and I bring up a story. It was uh, Jeremy Thompson who brought this to my attention. He had been reading in mythology, I guess, and brought this up, and I found this fascinating in connection with this story. Uh, Encyclopedia says concerning Ovid, born March 20, 43 B.C., Solmo, Roman Empire, now Solmona, Italy, died A.D. 17, you argue, if you go backwards in time from the numbers in B.C., um, Thomas Mosius, now Constanta, uh, R uh, Romania, uh, Latin in full Publius Ovidus Nasio, Roman poet, noted especially for his Ars Amor Amartoria and Metamorphosis. His verse had immense influence both by its imaginative interpretations of classical myth and as an example of supreme technical accomplishment. So, all of that to introduce you to Ovid and his book, Metamorphosis. He wrote a story recorded in Book the Eighth, clever title, <laughs> Book the Eighth, and called The Story of Baucis and Philemon. I wanted to quote to you part of the story, and uh, you'll see the influence of this. Um, his story goes like this. Two neighboring trees with walls encompassed round stand on a moderate rise with wonder shown, one a hard oak, a softer linden one. I saw the place and them by Pythias sent to Phrygian realms, my grandsire's government. Not far from thence is seen a lake, the haunt of coots, I guess that's birds, and of the fishing cormorant. Now, he tells the backstory here. 
He says, Here Jove with Hermes came, but in disguise of mortal men, concealed their deities. One laid aside his thunder, one his rod. And many toilsome steps together trod, for harbor for a thousand doors they knocked. Could we stay at your house? Not one of all the thousand, but was locked, didn't come to the door. At last, an hospitable house they found, a homely shed. The roof, not far from the ground, was thatched with reeds and straw together bound. There, in this little lowly house, Baucus and Philemon lived, and there had lived and there had lived long married and a happy pair, now old in love, though little <clears throat> was their store. They didn't have much. Inured to want, they were used to it, their poverty they bore, nor aimed at wealth, professing to be poor. We're happy to live in a simple fashion. So this story, like the story of Lot and the angels, Balchus and Philemon welcomed the wandering guests only to find that they were gods. As a reward to them for their hospitality, the gods declare, and we go back to the story, the neighborhood said he shall justly perish for impiety. You stand alone exempted, but obey with speed and follow where we lead the way. Leave these accursed to the mountain's height, ascend, nor once look backward in your flight. Sounds like they took it from uh, the uh, destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, doesn't it? Saving of Lot. So, uh, however, once they are saved from the destruction of their village, their home, once that lowly shed, is transformed into a great temple as they had honored the gods, the uh, gods honored that home. They requested to stay and serve the temple. These were, they'd grown old in love, they were, they were ready to, uh, to die, but they requested to stay and serve the temple rather than go someplace else. And the gods turned them into the trees that stand before the temple. And this is the trees that this uh, uh, Ovid was uh, talking about at the beginning. Now the story is to have taken place in Phrygia the people of Lystra were not far from there and were probably very aware of the story. So with that in their mind, and this with the priests, of course, uh, having it in mind, uh, this remarkable healing evidently led the people to think these gods have returned to the area. So let's really be hospitable here. <laughs> no destroying of Lystra. Let's, uh, let's welcome them, see. All right, well, with that, then, uh, we will stop and uh, look next time at uh, this misinterpretation, sad misinterpretation, and how it affected the people, how it affected the apostles, as, as they said, oh, great. <laughs> That's the opposite of what we wanted to happen because they were, they actually were bringing things to sacrifice unto them, you know. So uh, we'll see how they, how they handle that next time as God allows. All right, any update on the uh, parking situation? Four. Got yeah, four? Okay. So uh, we've equaled, la la equaled last year. Okay. All right. Comments or questions? <coughs> Isn't that interesting? Jeremy finds that uh, story in the mythology and find that it's located right, right next to Lystra, uh, giving us a, a reason why they, they came up with this, why those specific gods, you know. Uh, there it is. All right, well, let's stand together and we'll be dismissed with prayer. Our Father, how we thank you that you have given us the opportunity to study your word to look into it, to understand your truth. We pray that you might help us, Father, to recognize that 
even our good works can be misinterpreted and can be attributed to things other than you. We ask that you might help us then to be very quick to defer all thanks and praise to you, to defer um, when we do that is good, to say as Christ did, there's one good, but there's none good but God. And we ask that you might help us to uh, point out that if they have found anything good in us, if anything um, memorable, worthwhile, or or helpful has been happened uh, through our words or or deeds, that uh, we are to give thanks to God. So we pray thy blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.